Happy New Year. Welcome back to campus. Thank you for swimming here. We're delighted that you're all here. Um, this is an exciting occasion, and I want to, I should say who I am to start, apologies. I'm Danielle Allen, director of the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics, and we are one of the co-sponsors of this event alongside the government department where Michael Rosen has taken the leading role in pulling this together with lots of support from colleagues in the philosophy department and of course also the very generous support of the Secura Foundation for which we're extremely grateful. This is an amazingly special occasion um, to gather together so many students of Rawls, philosophers who work in moral and political philosophy, not as students of Rawls, but from a different perspective, but nonetheless recognize the accomplishments of the preeminent uh, thinker of the 20th century. Um, but we're also asking new questions, questions that didn't get answered um, by Rawls, questions that others have put on the table, expanding the conversation. There's a funny way in which I think Michael is extremely cunning in his design of this event in the sense that we are two years away from the centennial of Rawls's birth, so I see a, a volume coming out that split a hundred years since 1921. Um, and it is really an astonishing thing to think that we are so close to Rawls's hundredth birthday. He's so very present, um, not just on this campus, but intellectually to the broad world, to think that it's actually a hundred years worth of work that we have been digesting, you know, sets one back a little bit, um, makes one consider um, wh where we've been, also where we are going. Rawls is very present, uh, not just, of course, intellectually, but also for us at the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics, where he was an early, very active participant, as I understand it, and really part of the founding generation, helped anchor the purpose of the center as the founding director, Dennis Thompson, and others strove to help philosophy re-engage broadly with public questions, strove to help those in the professions and policy-making spaces recognize that there was no decision they could make that didn't have normative consequences, that they, they therefore ought to be responsible for those normative consequences. So for us all to be able to come together as a community of students and admirers of Rawls and to think about the questions that are next on the agenda coming out of the big project of understanding justice and ethics in public affairs um, is, again, it's a very special occasion. So with no more ado, but hopes only for a combination of fun and good intellectual work um, over the next couple of days, I'd like to invite Michael Rosen to give us proper introductory remarks. Michael. Thank you, Danielle. Of course, you said what I wanted to say, only briefer and better, but that is the, the way of things. My name is Michael Rosen. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to Inequality, Religion and Society, John Rawls and After. And I'm very glad that those of you who've traveled to be with us here have made it safely without, I hope, too many inconveniences from the New England weather. And for those of you, those of us who are New Englanders, well, that's pretty nice weather for this time of year, isn't it? So aren't we lucky? <laughs> and I mean that only half flippantly. Uh, when we planned the conference, uh, uh, we had in our memories uh, a couple of years ago when the whole of Boston was shut down at this time of the year under three feet of snow. So just a little bit of wind and rain is uh, idyllic compared with that. The idea for this conference came nearly two years ago from Ludex Secura. And I don't suppose that there's anyone here who needs persuading that the thought of John Rawls is important. But hardly a week goes by without a conference or workshop in his work somewhere. So why this meeting? Why now? Is it to anticipate the centenary? And why here? Well, where else? To explain our starting point, let me give you an analogy. Who of us can imagine what Paris would be like without the Eiffel Tower? What would Rome be like without St. Peter's? Or Prague without the Hrajni Castle? In a similar way, certain works can come to dominate an intellectual landscape to the point that everything else comes to situate itself in relation to them. If ever there were such a work of philosophy, it is surely Rawls's A Theory of Justice. Now, I well remember when A Theory of Justice first appeared on the scene. It was published in my second year as an undergraduate, and I have to say I read it immediately. What strikes me now, at a distance of nearly 50 years, is how difficult I found it to grasp 
and how much my understanding of it has changed during that time. And in that, I wasn't alone. Shortly after the book's appearance, a famous seminar on it was held in Oxford, led by Herbert Hart, Ronald Dworkin, and Stuart Hampshire. It was a graduate seminar, but my tutor, Stephen Lukes, kindly petitioned the organisers to let me attend on the grounds that I had at least read the book. It's one of my abiding regrets that although, although all kinds of embarrassing undergraduate juvenilia have accompanied me on my journeys around the globe, my notes from that seminar seem to have been irretrievably lost. But my memory is that those older and more distinguished readers were also puzzled. What remains clearly, and the outspoken marginalia in my copy of the book confirm, I'm afraid, is two early impressions. First, it seemed to me then that it was a book whose main goal was to mount a critique of utilitarianism, using the tools of decision theory. And from that point of view, its central argument hardly seemed, to us, very persuasive. Why should the parties in the original position not apply considerations of risk? To prohibit that from the outset seemed, the complex apparatus of the original position notwithstanding, to beg the question. And anyway, or so I thought, in those days I was an aficionado of Alistair McIntyre, C.B. McPherson, and Robert Paul Wolfe, weren't there already plenty of other, perhaps more penetrating, critiques of utilitarianism on offer? More significant, perhaps, was the context in which I was reading it. The book outlines, obviously enough, the institutional framework for a just society, articulated at a high level of abstraction. Behind it, however, it was hard not to believe were the lineaments of American constitutional democracy, not perhaps matching it perfectly, but closely enough to be recognizable. Yet, for young people around the world at that time, one fact about the United States stood out. That it was, and had been for nearly a decade, engaged in a war to support a military dictatorship in the third world country, and that it was prosecuting that war with all of its resources without regard for the wishes of that country's people or the sovereignty of neighboring states. How could a society that was, if not perfectly just, then at least, so far as one could tell Rawls's views, sufficiently near to justice that outright a bet rebellion against it wasn't justified, do such unjust things? A theory of justice, to my eyes, seemed to have nothing to say about all that. Now, those reactions, you might say, were sophomoric. Indeed, they were. I was, after all, a sophomore. But I share them with you now to make a wider point. Rawls did not make things easy for his readers. And one reason for this, surely, is that Rawls was not simply entering an established field of debate, but largely creating it himself. Political philosophy at that time was not, it was if not dead, as some had alleged, at least not vigorously alive. And this makes it understandable that Rawls' own judgments about what it was important to elaborate and what could be dealt with more sum summarily did not in many cases match his readers. It's striking, for example, that a theory of justice explains in painstaking detail what Pareto optimality means, something to be found in every e introductory economics book, while skating across the nature of liberty in a brief and to my mind, unsatisfactory couple of pages. In consequence, the understanding of Rawls' work, and in this respect strikingly similarly to his great predecessor, Immanuel Kant, has depended to an unusual degree on the readings of his most prominent expositors and interpreters, both hostile and sympathetic. And although those framing conceptions have changed over the years, there's no need for me to rehearse them, I'm sure, the challenge of clearing our vision as best we can remains with us. It's a duty we owe to the legacy of a great philosopher. But there's something else as well. So far, I'm sure you've noticed, I've just spoken about a theory of justice as though it were a unique, independent achievement. But there is, of course, much more to Rawls's work, both before and after. Indeed, no one who has engaged with it at all seriously could fail to be struck, surely, by the way that Rawls' career is marked by an intense intellectual restlessness, something that doesn't make it easy for his interpreters. How far are the many changes by which it's marked matters of substance, or as he himself naturally generally represented them? Here again, the parallel with Kant is very striking. 
largely matters of presentation and clarification. Such difficulties and complexities would, to my mind alone, be sufficient to justify our meeting. All the more so that a new, given that a new generation of scholars is engaging with Rawls, informed not just by his published work, but also, as Eric Nelson has just pointed out to us, by the rich and illuminating stock of unpublished material that's now accessible. Yet we can approach things from the other direction too. If our reflections are to be of more than antiquarian interest, we should ask, surely, how helpful Rawls' version of liberalism is for us now, as we see levels of inequality far beyond anything envisaged in the Trente Glorieuses following World War II, witness the revival of hot and strong revealed religion with theocratic aspirations, face surly nationalistic publics impatient with, if not downright hostile to, the norms and structures of democratic politics, and, if all of that were not enough, seem to be careering towards a global environment that will leave our grandchildren and great-grandchildren with a world far less favourable to human flourishing than that which we ourselves found. It was our conviction, and we hope that the next three days will bear it out, that those two projects, to look at Rawls's thought in context and to assess how useful it remains in relation to contemporary problems, are complementary and supportive. That we can be, to borrow, as I've often done before, a quip of Derek Parfitt's, both archaeologists and grave robbers. And to that extent, to that end, we've assembled, as you can see, an extraordinary cast of speakers and commentators for our mutual benefit. That we've been able to do so is thanks to the effort of many people, and I should now like, on behalf of all of us, to express gratitude to them. First of all, thanks go to Ludek Sekira. Not only was this event his idea, but through the Sekira Foundation and the Charles University Center for Political Philosophy, Ethics and Religion, he's given it his unswerving material and intellectual support. Ludek is a leading Czech businessman who, not content with rebuilding his nation's capital physically, has taken on himself the perhaps even harder task of protecting its civic society and democratic culture. His understanding of and discerning appreciation of philosophy is something for which we all have reason to be very grateful. This meeting's been supported organizationally, as you've heard, by the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics. I'd like to add now not just how indebted I am to Danielle and the center institutionally, but personally to the center and its staff and to three of its members in particular. Maggie Gates, to whom we owe, among other things, the striking and unusual poster and program and the wonderful, uh, the, uh, wonderful uh, slideshow that uh, I'm sure was absorbing you uh, until very recently. Vicky Alden, who, as speakers will know, has tactfully and efficiently arranged their ta travel and accommodation, uh, but has taken on much, much more besides. And Jess Miner, who's coordinated, reminded, and very occasionally cajoled us into doing what needed doing exactly when it was necessary. I was going to say that all three have worked tirelessly to make this event a success, but that would be to understate things unfairly. I should say that they have worked and are continuing to work tiredness notwithstanding, uncomplainingly and without stint. My deepest and warmest thanks to them. <laughs> May I next mention the departments of philosophy and government, both of whom have supported this project enthusiastically. As we all know, regretfully, regrettably, uh, not everyone uh, in such an event, even such a large event, can be in the limelight. And there are less glamorous roles that are nonetheless vital. That those whom we've asked to help in this way have taken them on so cheerfully and uncomplainingly reminds me again of how fortunate I am in my colleagues. I should also like to thank those who shared the task of planning and structuring the event with me. Danielle Allen, Eric Beerbohm, Eric Nelson, Tim Scanlon, 
Ludek Sikira and Lukas Stancic. As those who know them will tell, they are a diverse group, but they're united by wisdom and a willingness to work together for the greater good. I'm confident that their good judgment will be vindicated in the course of the next few days. And one of the sources of my confidence is the fact that almost everyone whom we asked to take part in this event accepted our invitation so speedily and with such enthusiasm. We shall start to reap the benefits of that commitment in a few minutes. But finally and first, I would like to share a message from someone who, for reasons I'm sure we all understand, can't be with us today. I know that many of us follow events in Europe and in particular those in Hungary, closely and with intense concern. So I think that these words in a message from Michael Ignatieff will be of relevance. I now quote. All his life, John Rawls stood for liberal pluralism. When he first wrote A Theory of Justice, liberal pluralism was encircled by communist regimes. For several decades after 1989, liberal pluralism was in the ascendant. It became the political destination for many countries transitioning out of single party rule. Now, in 2019, the circle has turned again, and in many countries, Poland, Hungary, Turkey, Russia, China, the single party regime is once again in the ascendant. With this development come new pressures on the university, an institution that, along with the courts and a free media, serve as a pillar of any liberal pluralist society. In Hungary, it has resulted in a two-year campaign to drive Central European University out of Budapest. The university has been forced to move its US degree programs to Vienna, and while it will continue to maintain a strong presence in Budapest, the regime has scored a major victory in its campaign to replace liberal pluralism with illiberal democracy. Those of us who've been inspired by rules will have to stay at our places here in Budapest, but we hope that the conference and its participants will bear in mind the darkening historical context in which your discussions take place. But that salutary reminder, I think I may say, is one that should increase, not curb, our enthusiasm. And in that spirit, may I now pass proceedings to Eric Nelson and to our first panel. Thank you very much.